advocate with the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Two weeks ago was March 15th and we recognized Equal Pay Day. That's the day that symbolizes how far into the year women work to earn what men had earned in the previous year. Additionally, this Friday, April 1st, kicks off Financial Literacy Month. These two awareness events are really important to the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence in our efforts to support survivors um, and in our mission to end all forms of violence and oppression. So therefore, um, today we're going to take a deep dive into the connections between pay equity, financial abuse, and economic justice for survivors of domestic violence, um, as well as the impact that COVID has had on the gender wage gap. Um, so we have with us today Ashwarya Sinha. She is the pre a prevention specialist at PCADB, and she's also the author of our PCADB Pay Equity Report. So Ashwarya, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Lauren. So yeah, like you mentioned, financial abuse occurs in most of the abusive relationship, and that it can actually prevent someone from leaving. Now, abusers use many tactics to sort of prevent uh, a victim from leaving, and it includes economic exploitation or economic control or economic sabotage. And some of the tactics that they may use includes paying bills late or not paying bills that were in the victim's name, basically ruining someone's credit, threatening to spend money needed for rent or other bills and building up debt under the victim's name uh, by doing things like using their credit card or running up the bills, which prevents the victim from being able to leave. They also exert economic control. They may demand to know where the money is being spent or keep the, the victim's financial and bank, st bank statements in check. And they may also prevent victims from going to their job or giving 100% at their job. Basically, they use tactics that underlies the survivor's ability to be self-sufficient. And when we talk about financial abuse, we also talk about pay inequity or the gender wage gap. And it is basically the difference between men and women's median earnings and shows how much women earn relative to men. So when we talk about wage gap and financial abuse, women have less access to financial independence to begin with. There are many ba barriers that prevent victims from maintaining or obtaining stability. So if someone wants to leave uh, an abusive situation, but they can't access housing or employment or can't pay for their food, it makes it harder for them to leave and sustain themselves so they may return back for the financial well-being for the, of themselves and their families. Thanks, Ashoria. Yeah, you know, it's unfortunate because even though you mentioned that like 98% of abusive relationships um, contain financial abuse as, as tactics that are used in those relationships, only 78% of Americans or sorry, 78% of Americans don't recognize financial abuse as a form of domestic violence. So, you know, I think it's really important that we're talking about this today. Um, you know, abuse is really about power and control. And when you can control someone's financial situation or their access to um, money, their access to their own finances, then you can really exercise a huge amount of control over what they're able to do, especially when it comes to leaving an abusive situation, which you mentioned that you know, this really creates some barriers for a lot of victims who mm -hmm. um, might want to leave, but they feel like they have no choice but to stay because they have nowhere to go and they have no financial resources um, with which to start over, start a new life um, of safety and stability. Um, and I, I do want to mention that those um, tactics that Ashwari was talking about, um, you can find a list of those tactics and some additional information about them on PCADD's website. We'll drop that link into the, the chat to, to take a, a further look at those tactics of financial abuse. Um, so Ashwari, I did want to talk a little more about the connection between pay equity and domestic violence. Why is this issue so important to PCADB and to survivors um, when it comes to um, the gender wage gap and domestic violence? So pay inequity or being paid unequally can, can lead to 
negative economic impact on women and their families. And PCADV sees the connection from pay inequity to domestic violence in two ways. One, pay inequity creates conditions like poverty, harmful gender norms, or housing insecurities that are known risk factors for someone to exper experience intimate partner violence or domestic violence. For example, if pay equity, which is equal pay for work similar in value is achieved, half of the women working full-time in the United States would be raised out of poverty. Even in Pennsylvania, the current poverty rate for employed women is right now at 7%. And if pay equity is achieved, it will go down to 3.4%, which is a nearly four percentage down points. So as, and as I mentioned, poverty is a risk factor for intimate partner violence. So achieving pay equity and reducing the rates of women in poverty can in turn help reduce the number of women at risk for experiencing abuse. Now, the second way we see this connection is that when pay, uh, when women are not being paid equally and when domestic violence exists, it creates challenges for victims and survivors to leave abusive relationships and find independence. And as Aaron mentioned, it basically diminishes the victim's capacity to support themselves and force them to depend on their financial, uh, on their abuser financially, and they may not be able to get out of out of a situation like this. Great. So I'm, I'm what I'm basically hearing is that there's both a prevention and an intervention side to that connection. So mm -hmm. on the prevention side with um, pay inequity, it leads to those societal conditions that are risk factors for domestic violence. And then on the intervention side, that lack of financial stability that pay equity exacerbates, um, that is a barrier to, to women being able to leave abusive relationships or stay, stay independent and create safe and secure lives for themselves um, mm -hmm. free from their abusers. Is that, am I hearing that correctly? Yep. Awesome, thank you for that. And um, what is the current status of the gender wage gap in the United States? So today in the United States, a woman who works full-time only earns 83 cents for every dollar earned by a man. And when we include women and uh, men who work both part-time and full-time, women have only made 77 cents for every dollar a man makes, which translates to a to an average loss of $530,000 over the course of a woman's lifetime. Now, given the current status of the gender wage gap, it is very important to remember that the wage gap is a systemic problem and not an individual choice. So with everything going on currently, the wage gap exists regardless of the job and industry in which a woman is employed, whether they have a bachelor's degree or a PhD, whether they are married or not, or whether they have a child or not. So what we found in our research is that the wage gap begins right out of college. Women are offered lesser starting salaries and are less likely than men to be fully employed in their first year out of college. And when they do have a steady job, women earn less and young women contribute a more significant portion of their salaries in repaying student loans. And women suffer from the pay gap even as they progress along the educational ladders so women who work full-time and have a master's degree still make only 72 cents for every dollar a man gets, irrespective of whether or not the man has a matching or lesser degree. And there's a high level of gender discrimination in every field, be it legal, healthcare, tech industry, or any other paying professions. And even in fields that are dominated by women, like social work or academics, the gap exists and often women are paid less than their male counterparts in these fields too. And the gap is worse for women who are mothers because they suffer uh, the motherhood penalty, which is the cost a woman bears when she decides to have a child. And they are paid hardly 71 cents for every dollar a father makes. And what is worse, this gap is worse for women of color because women of all major racial, ethnic groups earn less than their male counterparts and also earn less than white men and women. So, Soria, um, I, I did want to ask a, a quick follow-up question. Um, you, you mentioned the 
motherhood penalty. And I, I did want to just dive a little bit deeper into that, unless that's something you were planning on getting into later. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about what might be some of the mechanisms behind that? Why, um, why is it that, that mothers um, tend to make even less than women in general compared to their male counterparts? So the issue is that employers see mothers as less qualified uh, candidates. So when we, when we did our research, we found out that women who were mothers were offered lower starting salaries because they were perceived less competent and they were also less likely to be recommended for hire than non-mothers. So they were viewed as less committed to the job and more committed to their family. And that's why they were offered less uh, starting salaries. Whereas what, what was funny that when men became fathers, this was just the opposite. They were seen as more committed and were offered higher pay. So, you know, they could provide for their families. So that's why the gap for mothers are worse. Thanks, Sharia. And, you know, I, I wanted to dive into that a little bit deeper, partly because you, you mentioned how um, this pay inequity leads to an increase in poverty. And obviously, like, that's a really big issue for um, families. So with children mm -hmm. living in poverty, and so if mothers are being punished even more than um, women who don't have children by the gender wage gap, um, then obviously that's not something that we want in our society where we want people to be able to take care of their families and afford to um, provide for their for their children and their families. Obviously, all women should be paid what they are worth and equal to men. But the fact that it's worse for mothers, I think, is just a, a, a really bad sign of, of how this wage gap um, impacts us all as a society. Yeah, and also like imagine for mothers who are single-handedly running the household expenses, it becomes so much more tougher because they have to make a choice if they put their salary towards providing food, if they put their salaries toward getting education opportunities for themselves, or if they use that salary to save money for a rainy day. So they have to make these choices and it just, it leads to so, so much more disparities. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so how has COVID impacted the gender wage gap and the, how has it impacted women's employment um, as well? So COVID has been called a she session and rightly so because with the onset of COVID in 2020, more women than men lost their jobs and most of the women who lost their jobs were low wage workers. So there are so many factors that contributed to women leaving the workforce, which includes massive layoffs, the inability to access childcare, additional household work, impact of remote work and inflexible work schedules. And we don't even have all the data yet to fully understand this impact COVID has had on women and wage gap. But what we do know is working women and women of color have been particularly impacted by COVID. They are having a harder time finding employment and women are leaving the workplace because of lack of sick, safe parental paid leave, lack of childcare and lack of affordable childcare at that point. And then the work that women do continue to be grossly undervalued even, even when the pandemic hit. And since they're paid unequally, they are at a risk for experiencing so many other things like poverty, housing insecurities, and then which may likely increase their risks of experiencing intimate partner violence and other forms of abuse. So pay equity has actually led to a rise in the domestic violence rates and led to a rise in the fact that women are still being paid unequally. Sure. Yeah, I know that um, currently, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's um, right now calculated that women on average make 83 cents mm -hmm. to the dollar. And I guess previously it was 82. But really what you're saying is that um, what appears to be progress is actually more symptomatic of the fact that the women who left the workforce during COVID, during 
the the economic hardships that we we faced because of the pandemic Mm -hmm. tended to be the lower wage uh, workers that had an even bigger um, gap in in their pay. Is that am I assessing that correctly? Yeah, because like when when they when we calculate the pay gap, we only include women who are still in the workforce and they, who have a full time job. So it so it basically excludes anyone who has already left. And since there has been a huge huge exit of the number of women leaving the workforce, they're already excluded from the ratio. So what appears to be, like you said, a progress is actually just not being inclusive of all and the data is just misleading. And that's why the number has risen from 82 cents to 83 cents. So sure, yeah. Um, and speaking of that 83 cents, I know that's kind of an overall number. So I, I wanted us to talk a little bit more about how that number breaks down when we when we look at that more by industry or by job type, because as you mentioned before, pay inequity exists regardless of what industry a woman works in or what level of education she may have. Um, so can we dive a little bit deeper into what that breakdown looks like so that we're not just looking at the overall, but really more by job title, by industry? Um, how does that wage gap exist for women um, when we, when we break it down like that. Sure. So you look at any industry or any job title, be it CEO or teacher, the gap exists, uh, and it like, it exists irrespective of the job in which a woman is employed. So you look at any industry in civilian industries, women only make 72 cents for every dollar a man is paid. So even in manufacturing and retail industries, women are hardly paid 76 or 79 cents respectively. And what is what can be noted is the hiring and promotion of women uh, in leadership positions are rare. And it, so, and even when they get to that position, they still make close to 72 cents in management jobs. And the higher paid professions have more more likely are more likely to have a double digit gap. So as you can see in the graph here, look at look at the chief executive. The average difference between men CEO and women CEO is huge. Even in any industries, financial managers or architects or registered nurses, you can see the gap exists. And this is basically because the work that women do is valued less than work done by men. And so they are paid less than men. And, you know, in in the last few years, more women have participated participated in the labor force than men. More women have participated in the labor force than men. But the wage gap has been persistent because they're they're offered, they earn less income and they're offered lower starting salaries. So the wage gaps still exist, even in occupations they dominate. Victoria. Um, I also wanted to ask you about the Equal Pay Act of 1963. So obviously we've had this around for a long time, um, yet we still have not achieved the pay equity that was supposed to be promised with, with the passage of this Equal Pay Act. Can you talk a little bit about why we have struggled to achieve pay equity despite having this law, this federal law in place? So there's only one word for that, discrimination. Now, women, especially women of color, experience workplace discrimination when it comes to getting a job, getting a promotion, and getting paid equally. And there are so many loopholes in the Equal Pay Act that sort of allows employers to avoid accountability. For example, they may change the job titles for men and women in the same position, even though the job responsibilities are the same. And this allows organizations to avoid legal charges in case someone makes a case of getting paid less. They can always say, you know, job titles are different and hence the different pay. So until and unless someone conducts a pay audit and actually reflects on what both like both positions have the responsibilities and if they are similar, nobody will know that, you know, they're they're getting paid less or uh, it's just a gimmick used by employers. 
And one of the things in United States is many organizations and states discourage conversations around pay by making it illegal for coworkers to discuss their salary with their peers. So this prevents folks from knowing what other people are earning and hence they're, they're basically under the false impression that they're pay, being paid equally and you know there's there's no checks at place to even know if you're getting paid unequally. Yeah, so pretty much the onus with this Equal Pay Act would be on mm-hmm. the individual to say, hey, I am not being paid fairly. I need mm-hmm. to go and sue my employer through this Equal Pay Act. But like, if, if you don't know that you're not being paid equally or know that you have recourse available to go back to your employer and say to them, like, you're not paying me equally and this is against the law. If Mm -hmm. people, if individuals don't take those steps, nothing happens. It's not like this law guarantees equal pay without without people as individuals holding their employers accountable. Mm -hmm. Um, And they can't do that if they don't even know that they're not being equally paid. And also, you know, and I I guess it's not just women that this is among, this might be with men too, but you know, it's kind of a little bit taboo in our society to talk a lot about money. Like you don't necessarily Mm -hmm. like (laughs) have conversations all the time with your friends about how much you're making at your job. It's just not something that's often done. And so if we, as women aren't talking about how much we're getting paid, we don't know if Mm -hmm. we're undervaluing our own work, if we're not being paid fairly, um, whether that's within our own job or just like within the industry, um, So, yeah, it's unfortunate that we have, it seems like we have something in place that should be protecting us from this, yet it doesn't seem to be really doing, doing its job very well, unfortunately. Um, But not to be all doom and gloom, because I know that you have some um, recommendations to improve the situation. So Mm -hmm. I would love for you to tell us about some of the concrete action steps that organizations can take to help end the gender wage gap? Yeah, sure. So basically organizations and employers can promote an equal pay culture by promoting pay transparent policies. And that could look, that could look differently for every employer, but it basically includes maybe like providing flexible work schedules, especially in the light of COVID and the transition to remote work. So, you know, it allows employees to meet their work responsibilities if your organization provides for flexible work time and you know they don't have to make a tough decision between work and family responsibilities. The second thing would be to ban salary history question uh, when asking candidates about their like about their salary expectations because it stops the cycle of underpay and this is important because if folks are paid are being paid unequally at one job and we ask for their salary history, we're basically setting them up in the same cycle. The third thing would be to post salary ranges to be clear and upfront about the pay. Now, and this would help promote transparency when you know job applicants are negotiating their pay. And also it puts the onus of pay equity on the employer and not individuals. Employers can determine what to pay folks rather than asking the candidates to determine their pay and then determine their worth. And again, like you mentioned, women are usually taught to undervalue their work. So they may they may give a low number and employers will just go with that because again, it saves them money and saves them accountability. And the other thing would be to conduct pay equity audit to ensure your employees are being paid fairly and analyzing job descriptions from time to time to receive uh, to remove any unnecessary jargon. For example, like not all jobs require an advanced degree or the ability to be ability to be physically fit, whatever that may entail. So keeping these requirements, if they're not necessary in a job description, limits uh, an organization's candidate pool and you know sort of promotes discrimination. And again, there are several pieces that can get us closer to pay equity, which could include employers providing paid uh, paid safe and sick leave, which could provide, uh, which could also allow like 
employers providing access to childcare and parental leave and you know employers making sure that they're providing a living wage which sort of helps women afford the basic necessities of life and you know i mean I, this is the right time when i should say like living wage is great but organizations should actually focus on providing a thriving wage because living wage basically provides for basic needs and a thriving wage actually allows a person to live beyond paycheck to paycheck and provides enough money for savings travels hobbies investments or whatever the employee wants to do and another important thing for organizations to remember is to incorporate dei diversity equity and inclusion practices in their organization because this wage gap or pay inequity exists because of inequities at structural and policy levels so if organizations include dei practices and work towards equity in their organization they will support pay equity efforts and i want to mention that we talk about these action steps and much more in our new fact sheet that has been released today and i think we we will link it in the chat for everyone to see so i just encourage folks to go there and learn more yeah, thank you for mentioning that, Ashwarya. Yeah, um, the, the link will be in the chat to access the new um, gender wage gap fact sheet. And that fact sheet includes this list of action steps um, that Ashwarya has mentioned. So if you um, are a decision maker in your organization, or if you have access to decision makers in your organization, um, or even if you're just an employee somewhere and you want to talk to your organization about um, in, improving their policies to help um, improve transparency around pay to, to reduce that gender wage gap within your organization. Um, definitely check out that fact sheet. Um, take a look at the recommendations that we make to help reduce those um, that would help reduce the, the gap. Um, we, we'd really appreciate it. Um, the, the more that we change the, the culture around pay equity, um, the, the better we'll be able to move this forward. And, you know, we can't do it alone. We're going to need, um, we're going to need everybody to, to get on board and, um, and help us with this, um, with this initiative. So definitely check that out. Talk to your organization about what you could do, um, at least within your organization, so to reduce the inequities in pay that might exist there. Um, Ashwarya, you mentioned the DEI work, and I do just want to bring us back a little bit to um, just mention a little bit more about the difference that exists for um, women of color, because the, the gap is much wider. I and mean, we talked a little bit about how the gap was even wider for mothers, um, and the gap is also wider for women of color. So could you just give us a little bit of a comparison to, to let folks know, like, where, where do... Um, Black women, Latinx women, um, Native women stand compared to their their white counterparts and the rates for women overall. Sure. So as I mentioned, it the pay gap is worse for women of color because women of color nationally they earn so much less than white men and as well as white females. So black women earn close to sixty two cents and Latinas earn close to fifty seven cents and Native uh, women earn close to 61 cents for every dollar a white man gets. And the wage gap is more punishing for them because they have to uh, endure further social hindrances because of racism and other, dis uh, other factors of discrimination. So the wage gap is worse for them and they, they face the cycle of being underpaid and the cycle of not getting promoted. So there's there's such, so much more discrimination when it comes to women of color uh, and and the impact of wage gap on them. Thank you. Yeah, we want to make sure that all women are um, able to have that thriving wage and and live the type mm -hmm. of life that you described there, and not have to worry about this. Um, and obviously, like that includes survivors too. We want survivors to have financial security to be able to. Um, get themselves to safety. Um, but a lot of survivors right now obviously don't um, have the resources to, um, to protect themselves and to seek 
safety and to, to leave their abusive situations. Um, so I did want to talk a little bit about um, for survivors out there right now that are experiencing financial abuse, um, how can they seek help? So I think for survivors, it's very crucial to learn more and understand economic abuse, because like you mentioned, Lauren, most of the people don't even recognize financial abuse as a part of domestic violence. So there needs to be education and there needs to be more awareness in terms of financial abuse and the guide on how to be financially independent. So, you know, survivors could connect with their local DV programs for access to economic supports. And, you know, in addition, there are many organizations that have a curriculum on how to identify and prevent financial abuse in an intimate relation. That includes the Allstate Foundation, the American Association for University Women. They basically have a guide on how to achieve financial independence. And those are great places to start. And again, when we talk about survivors, it's also important for organizations to remember that their staff may be survivors too. So providing a safe space and you know, providing paid leave for survivors to deal with a situation would be so much more better and so much helpful for organizations to promote an, a fair pay culture. So I think these are some of the steps survivors can do and even organizations can take to promote equal pay and learn more about financial abuse. And again, we've compiled a list of resources that do does contain more information. And like Lauren said, it's linked in the chat as well. So I think that would be helpful in promoting the culture of education and awareness. That's such a great point, Ashwarya, about um, employers understanding that, like, especially if they're a larger organization or a larger company, that they're very likely are survivors among their worst workforce. I mean, with one in four women and one in seven men experiencing domestic violence, chances are, unless you're a super tiny company, there's somebody in your organization that mm -hmm. either is or has experienced domestic violence. And so having policies like that, that allow for leave, paid leave, if somebody is um, having to deal with abuse and, and getting free from that abuse, um, or even just the, the medical um, things that can come along with abuse, that is so key. And, and I know that like, um, abusers as part of financial abuse will sometimes do things to sabotage their um, victims work and their ability to work. And so the more understanding employers are that that situation could be happening, the better that is for survivors as well. Um, and I'm trying to think of, of an example, but I mean, it, one could just be missing work because they have experienced physical violence and they can't go um, into their job. But I mean, abusers could do things such as like, um, take the car and not give their mm -hmm. um, their victim access to the transportation they need to get to work, and then the victim has to miss work. Um, and so, not seeing things like that as excuses that your employees are making, but seeing that as a real tactic of abuse that they're undergoing that has been designed to deprive them of their financial security and stability and their financial independence. Um, so, if employers can start to to understand that and have those flexible policies and that that understanding um, so that it's not as easy for um, abusers to harm of their victims capability to, to keep their job and to mm -hmm. have their own um, their own income and have their financial independence that's so that's so thank you for, for bringing that up Ashwari. I think that's a great point that like employers understanding some of those nuances of financial abuse and domestic violence is important as well as understanding how um, the gender wage gap is happening within their organization. Mm -hmm. um, all right, any, any final um, parting thoughts on financial abuse, on um, pay equity, on economic justice for survivors? Nope, I think just educate yourself and look up resources and just making the connection between financial abuse, domestic violence, and the fact that being paid unequally can create so many barriers, just I think that will start the conversation and that will lead to a change in the culture. So yeah, I just want to end with that. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Ashwarya. Um, and a lot of the 
resources that she mentioned. There's a, a huge list of um, links to resources from PCDB and from other organizations as well on our website. We have that um, we have that uh, link in the chat there. But if you go to PCADV.org, um, it is under our uh, gender wage gap page. You'll find a lot of resources there. It's a great place to get started. Um, or if you are a survivor, reach out to your local program. Um, if you go to PCADV.org slash find dash help, um, you can find your local program and they can help you there with things that you might not expect that relate to helping you achieve uh, financial independence. Um, they can help with financial skills and financial literacy. There's help with credit repair. There's help with um, housing, um, access to higher education, resume and interview skills. Um, the economic justice programs that uh, the local domestic violence programs have really can help a lot when it comes to planning for your long-term um, success with financial stability and independence. So we encourage you to reach out for help um, if you are experiencing financial abuse or any form of domestic violence. So thanks again, Ashwarya, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me.